and that was the cool thing. And that was what attracted to me to Hollywood in 77. It wasn't how people dress and any of that stuff, but that really the coolest bands were there. And that was why later I started coming to those bands down here. It was exactly the same thing in a way. I wasn't attracted to the social scene. That was just not how I am. But when you had Black Flag, and when you could go to a party, and Sonic Youth, Black Flag, The Minutemen, Saccharin Trust, and the Meat Puppets were playing on the street, you know, in DC3. That was the same feeling to me as as going to yeah, see the Weirdos and the Screamers. It was awesome bands, I thought, um, that nobody knew about, you know. The Meat Puppets were one of were a band that I I worshipped because I remember their first uh, single was just the most insane thing I'd ever heard ever. And then, you know, and then when the Black Flag, the Greg Ginns discovered them kind of and brought them over as part of the SST, I remember them playing at the Cuckoo's Nest, which was in Costa Mesa, which again, the audience was all that Huntington Beach crowd, that kind of just jockey, hardcore crowd. They played to them and they were just being pelted and like, so went through a whole like, like pitcher of water in Kirk Herkowitz's face. And they, it was just like, and they were fantastic, you know, just that weird, just, that's when they were just doing that wit, the most witchy music before they, before they kind of did the more country, countrified stuff later. But yeah, no, they were scary. They were like, you know, Charles Manson or John Waters. I don't know what I was hoping that punk rock would do for me, really. I, I mistook it for psychedelic music. I thought everybody was like into peace and love and that there was uh, just an exploitation of a good vibe. And then I, f I found out actually that uh, it was really that they probably were, but it was me that was hateful. We we're going to do what we we're going to do, and we definitely weren't going to be constrained by the fact that these people are all, you know, it's like that jello thing, fuck off, you know? You, you know. I mean, I didn't get into music to fucking, you know, have more pigs in my life. I had a lot, I think, to do more with the actual. Um, original feeling of what it was like to be depressed and stupid 
and to, you know, be a total loser and still think that you had enough going for you to like defy it, to play in a band or, you know, work at a grocery store, you know, any sort of low life, sort of white middle class trash um, way to, you know, try and prove to yourself once and for all that you know, you're not worthless by using worthlessness as your last ditch effort to you know, extricate yourself from the toilet you were born in. Nobody likes me. Everybody hates me. Fuck everyone. And most of the kids that were in the scene in the beginning were those kids that fucking never fit in anywhere, couldn't get along with anybody. You get spit out a lot. <laughs> We love Black Flag. We got we got to play a show with them in Phoenix, and they asked us to if we wanted to, to put a record out. And it's like they were always easy to get along with. They're like the same people. They, that's where we started finding kind of more more of our people, you know, in the hardcore scene, and not just like in the art scene that Derek knew about or was more hooked up with through Wiley, but the hardcore scene to uh, the LA hardcore scene and uh, I think Ginn got us in there like he always said it's just kind of fuck with other people too some you know and because he liked to do that and like I like this and the punkers are going to hate it even though it passes off as punk rock. And that was like the first night Henry played out here with them you know their new singer Henry that they got from DC it was just like whoa and that was another one of those like fucking full on hardcore punker shows you know where the kids are just like whoa, look, the cops came and somebody stole the cops' helmet, and the cops came in in force, and was like, "Fucking good, Lord!" You know, just nutty. You know? But uh, and then, then then it just asked us, "You guys want to do a record with us?" I was really high when we did the first one. Just it was just, just what happened. What are those I was really high when we did the second one, but it was different drugs. What was the difference? I was more intelligible on the second one. They asked us if we wanted to put out a record. You know, because they'd started, they'd had SSD going without those first few flags, seven inches, and then I think, I think they, 
they just put out that first Miniman album. I was tripping the light fantastic in the land of the beautiful people with Silver Lake. I think that's where we recorded that. No, no. The first one we recorded at Unicorn on Santa Monica. We were right on the fucking strip there on Santa Monica and fucking walk out just tripping balls and there's these dudes in sailor suits, cowboys, all this shit. It was like fucking Disneyland. I was just like, yeah, well, and then freaking Ginn skulking around, Dukowski, and just like surreal. What we was were, it like? We were on like acid for three straight days. And we just, you know, got a bunch of stuff going in there. It was like a three day fucking, you know, three, like, started to get tired. No sleep. Three day session nonstop. <laughs> Structure that was happening, you know, but it definitely just made it a lot more, you know, 
obvious, slowed things mm -hmm. way down, and suddenly, you know, it's just another happening, you know. And not that much really happened, like, other than, you know, some was like, just having done that other record and wanted to make a different kind of record, you know, and their band's ability to do it. You know, it's just, and that's one of our you know, hallmarks as the band, it's just, you know, wanting to do what you feel like doing, you know, and, and being really pretty fucking, you know, we had broad tastes and have, you know, the ability to play different feels and make more own. <laughs> was started, you know, started a long time ago. I really think that the, probably the best punk rock music has, it hasn't been played yet though. There's punks that haven't been born yet that are way punk. Totally just like don't care about anything. How'd you guys write your songs? Me and Debo. And then we'd show George. Usually come up with the title. Debo never wrote words hardly. What he would do is write words a little sayings, little ideas on paper and leave them around the house. And then I'd find them. Oh, psychological means to sell should be destroyed. You know, I make, and I make songs out of his words. They would be like his little observations. He never, only a few songs like Picnic. You know, the songs where he would write the music to, he would like write lyrics. But all the ones where you see Boone Watt, where he wrote the words, never written for me. They were just little papers. Because that would really inspire me.
D would just jam in your house. And that's I show them the parts. I always had beginning, middle, ends. D Boone songs always had two parts. Here's the verse, here's the chorus. And he liked them really short. He right, liked them really short. I built mine short too, but he liked them really short, man. He just did. I think he liked them with the, with the we'd have to have rests sometimes, you know, sometimes. We'd write songs that would have a drum front part just so we could have rest. So we didn't like stopping between the songs. Man, this stuff would beat on our fucking chest. Or we'd have things where D-Boom would play lead guitar for three or four minutes just so we could catch our breath. What you making, man? <laughs> Ideas, principles that a lot of people in music weren't into. Boone Holy was into that. I mean, not to try to make himself be better than you, just to fucking discuss it. <laughs> about him. I, me too. I used to, God, when, the, when we were touring in the van, everything. Talk about every fucking. I remember pulling over, we were getting, debating, having an argument about which king was excommunicated for something or other, and we pulled over and had a fucking library. 
you know, to go fucking settle this. Remember Georgie and the bad guy, how you idiot. We'd get into it. <laughs> split up the world into two groups. There was gigs and there was flyers. And videos, records, interviews, those were flyers. Playing in the club, that was a gig. That's the whole world to us. So everything was something to get the people to the show or the show. That's all there was. And uh, yeah, you didn't have like a, a, a other states of consciousness, this was it. You were either working on getting people to the show or you were playing the show. And anything else wasn't reality. She had a baby and I had a break. And I'm playing with, starting to play with nervous gender people like that again. Helen goes, why don't you just start your own band instead of playing with all these bands that she hated? All of them. Yeah. yeah. And so I go, okay, well. No one I want would, would ever be in, be in a band with me. I want it to be with Pat and blah, blah. And I go, why don't you ask them? Everyone said yes. Yeah. Kira. They all said yes. Kira. Kira Pat, Pat. Emil. Emil, who was a 16 year old. Drummer, that was really cool. It was cool. <laughs> and, Maggie. Uh, and Maggie. They all said yes. And they did it. And we played our... God. We were obnoxious out. We did our first show. At the Whiskey. At the Whiskey. It was just sold out. We were like in the, all the papers. The day I had my kids. Because this was the band that had... The, it was the return of a screamer and a germ together in a band. And everybody <laughs> thought it was the most intense thing. And instead... I mean, Darby had died. And it really... Sh definitely affect us. We were like... That was 81, right? Yeah. And we were happy. I mean, we had happy songs. We had nice songs. We had pissed off songs. It was totally punk rock. But um, we are people that write for the LA Weekly, uh, it was not it. correct for them, you know. All the HBers and all the kids thought it was great, you know. But um, people that expected a cross between the Screamers and the Germs, 
you know, we get up there and, and Maggie was the singer. She was 18, she could kind of sing, she had lots of personality, but she was just like, fuck with people, setting people on fire, and just, you know, totally obnoxious, getting drunk, and, and it was great. It was really a cool band, I totally was proud of it. It was musical, but um, it pissed off as many people, and plus that we had the arrogance to not open for people to come out headlining right away and totally take advantage of our position and and try to make as much money as we could out of it. And which people, you know, people didn't realize that that meant that we'd make $100 a piece sometimes from a show. You know, once every two months. But people figured we were really cashing in big time. Twisted Roots actually was a, a really cool band with young kids that had all the spirit that was noisy, that was like more like public image than anything yeah. else. Public image meets the Beatles, yeah. you know, but not played quite good enough. And, um, but man, people laid for us. And we deserved it because we had attitude and we didn't care. But poor Maggie could not take, you know, the fact she that. She never done it. She, I mean, for one thing, I, I became a lead singer later in bands, and I know what it's like. Being a lead singer is a weird trip. It's not like being a musician, it's being a different thing. And it affects your mind. And to have a whole bunch of people love you and a whole bunch of people hate you, and all the people love you kiss your ass and try to get close to you so they'll feel cool and then you don't trust them. And meanwhile, the people that hate you are like writing mean things about you in the newspaper that people read and stuff like that. And she just, she couldn't take it. And I don't blame her, it wasn't her fault, you know, but she can take that. And Emil, the drummer decided that he really wanted to surf. He didn't want, it was too much hassle, he wanted to surf more. You know, so he quit. He, 
Reincarnations, many. It's musical anarchy, not political anarchy. That stuck with me so much. That was to find it, that you can do whatever you want. It's more the vibe and the... It's not being a fucking asshole about your music. Well, I want to say hi to some smelly people. Come on down, California.
people were anti dinosaur rock, but they weren't necessarily anti rock star. You know, they were anti, you know, you know, hour, two hour jams. You know, like, uh, I don't know. You know. Kiss was obviously a big influence, the whole showman, and, uh, and, and them and Alice Cooper, you know, which definitely carried over into punk rock and, and, and especially the 1984 period where we became really um, outsiders because we kind of reconnected with this kind of um, rock and roll, rock star persona and um, at the time all the other bands were really like people's groups like you know we were really good friends with the Minutemen and Black Flag but they were all like of the people and we definitely were not of the people and that was our whole goal. It was a conscious effort. Peterson was my girlfriend for like the whole um, late teens, early 20, mid twenties, and um, yeah, and you know we had never collaborated on anything, and we Des had quit. That's right, Des was out of the band. We had made Teen Babes as a three piece, and that was right before we found Robert Hecker. So that was weeks before we found Robert, 
And um, yeah, I'm really glad that exists because that was the only time we ever jammed together. Was that the only show you played with her? Was yeah. Yeah, we never as much as jammed ever in those six years we were together. Linda Blair, 19. <laughs> We didn't want to be on SST. I mean, no offense to anyone involved at SST. It was scary because at the time, they, they, when they started really getting their thing together, putting out records and, and, um, and they were the shit, it was like kind of like this, this I was, I've always been really, really afraid of communities. Like anytime someone plugs into kind of a single personality kind of vibe, and that's the way it was, they were like a cult. And um, 
The only person I even related to in that period who was even connected was Raymond Pettibone, who was completely different from the rest of those people. So, you know, they weren't interested in us and we weren't interested in them. You know, and it wasn't any bad blood. I was still friends with a lot of, I mean, really good friends with a lot of the people involved, but they were a cult. Yeah.